What in the Joe Dirt mixed with Ernest Goes to the Zoo did I just watch on Netflix? Hello everybody and welcome to John Crimes, Crimes with Crimes. I want to start this off by saying please, please, please don't forget to hit the subscription button below. Also make, make sure you hit the bell icon next to it because you know how YouTube plays around and while we all sitting in the house with nothing to do, I want to make sure you guys catch all the videos I'm about to present to you. Now, my apologies, I wanted this video to come out on May the 31st because this video has nothing to do with the series I'm going to do for the month of April with the month of April being Child Abuse Prevention Month every case in April is going to be about child abuse with the first case being this weekend coming out on my channel on Gannon Stalk this is going to be crimes with crimes, crimes with crimes all month long until we get into my first documentary of the year which is going to be on a kid by the name of Adrian Jones a case someone in the comment section of my last video recommended to me and it touched me deeply and once I started looking up information I couldn't stop and I knew I wanted to make a documentary on it and it's how I'm gonna cap that off the final week of April so let this just be a freebie video that snuck in for the month as I'm stuck at home I begin to watch documentary on Netflix now I'm going to treat this as if I'm only talking to people who saw this because I know everybody has Netflix or somebody has a family member that has Netflix so you can get the password you need to pause this video and go watch it so I'm gonna talk like I'm talking to people who have already seen this documentary on a guy by the name of Joe Erotica <laughs> Joe Erotica. Now, if you already seen this documentary, you know it's about a zoo, well, a private zoo owner by the name of Joe Erotica that in a six part series, eventually, allegedly, not allegedly, since he's in jail for 22 years, put a hit out to end the life of Carol Baskin. So, how I feel about this documentary I feel that Joe is a hero to everybody now because they love him because of all of the memes that's going around. There's so much things on Twitter with hashtags, free Joe erotica. It's just all kind of insanity from this crazy documentary. But when we look at the evidence, Joe was not a very good person. You know, Joe literally abused the Tigers. He broke the law by trying to sell Tigers. He was not a good person, man. You know, uh, with the, he was a very narcissistic person. And watching this documentary reminded me of YouTube. We sit back and we look and we say, this is a crazy animal community. Well, guess what? There's a crazy hairstyle and makeup community over there on YouTube. There's a crazy cat loving community over there. There are even communities built around one specific uh, murder case on YouTube. So they're all kind of small communities and in these pockets of communities are people who hate each other. And it starts off slow and it snowballs into them doing things that they never would have considered themselves doing prior to them coming on YouTube, you know? Some of these people, you know, I'm not gonna say all of them, maybe just a little bit, a few, would have never imagined if I'm gonna go take care of some tigers, I'm gonna be involved in a murder plot. But they let their hatred for each other build and try to one up each other. You do this, I'm gonna do this to you. You do this, I'm gonna do this to you. So I'm watching it and it just reminded me of YouTube and all my time I've been on YouTube and seeing people change before my eyes and doing despicable behavior online until they are so lost and so drunk into this internet sort of road rage that they forget reality and they end up getting they they forget reality and they end up getting themselves in trouble. Another thing I want to say before I go into what this video is truly about, I want to say that while I know that Joe Erotica is a terrible human being and you know, he killed seven tigers, you know, buried them out in the yard and stuff. I want to say that I don't care. And what I mean when I say I don't care, I simply mean that he is serving time. If he was not serving time, I would care. 
The Joe Erotica story is over with. It ends. There's an ending to his story. He's serving 22 years in prison. He's probably not going to, you know, hopefully he's not going to make it to 22 years. Or maybe he will. Who knows? But that's the end of his story. This video is about Carol Baskin, who in this documentary about tigers, and she's the victim that they were trying to do a murder plot on, allegedly. It turned out around episode two, I'm sitting there and I'm eating my popcorn and I'm like, what the world just happened? Where is her, her husband is missing? Nah, they're just joking. They're joking, right? And then the whole entire next episode is this plot around how her husband has gone missing and he's still missing to this day. And I'm like, I'm glued now. I'm like, whoa, this is, this is some don't F with cats kind of stuff that's going on here because you're watching it and he does these horrible things to the little kittens and next thing you know, it's a real, you know, somebody's being harmed. So I want to look up and get more information than what they gave in the Netflix documentary. Also go over what her rebuttal was to it and what my opinion of her rebuttal is. So, I wanna say that Netflix came out and in the documentary that you watch, they pretty much laid it out that they had trouble in their marriage. She admitted they had some trouble in their marriage. They admitted that his car was found at an airport. Uh, admitted that he would take trips to Costa Rica. So, Maybe possibly he was parked at an airport, but then it was debunked that no planes left that day. There was no way that he left. That's what Netflix reported. They also said some things such as she possibly fed him to one of her tigers to get rid of the evidence. And they had the family on and the family said how she, she took money from them. And the family also said one hot piece of evidence is that a month before he went missing or two months before he went missing, he came to his ex-wife. Uh, I think he came to his daughter's. I'm not sure y'all looked that up. His daughter's ex-wife. But he gave him an envelope. And it was a restraining order against Carol Baskin saying that if anything happens to me, you know, she did it or, you know, she threatened to try to take his life. Um, and we're going to get into her rebuttal to that. So that's what Netflix laid out. They laid out that she could have fed him to the Tigers, car parked at the airport, they had some fighting, the restraining order was given, and possible meat grinder. All right, let's go through her entire life and let's look at the poised and always well put together that we, woman that we saw in the Netflix documentary and let's contrast that to the things we learned about her life growing up. Before we begin with her own birth, <laughs> I just want to lay out that whenever something outlandish happens, somehow there's never any witnesses. Just keep that in mind. Ready? Carol Baskin was born, Carol Stairs, to Vernon and Marie Stairs on 6-6 of 1961. 6-6-6? In San Antonio, Texas. Now, her father had many, many jobs uh, growing up, which caused the family to pick up and move a lot. So they started off in San Antonio, Texas, ended up spending a lot of time all the way until 1975 where they finally move up to Virginia. Now by this time, Carolyn Stairs is a 14 year old girl and she said that out of all the crazy jobs her father had when they got to Virginia, West Virginia, that's when she realized <clears throat> how much she hated men because they lie. And she found this out because her father was a private investigator and she saw a family, I think, do a man do something and she believed him but her father showed how the guy was lying through his career as a private eye and she was so amazed it just tr triggered something in her head that she just knew that all men were liars she was 14 years old at the time and at this time this is when she began to become sexually active and run away from home a lot because she had problems with her parents at 14 years of age she used to walk down the street and hitchhike a lot and she carry an axe with her in case a man tries to do something. When I hear information, and just, just so we're clear, just so we're clear, this information comes from Carol. This is her own mouth. She's saying these things. So it's not like I'm hearing this from someone else. But when I, I, I see this well posed and mannered, put together woman on this documentary, and then I look at the life that she lived, I don't know, it's just, in my opinion, 
I just don't believe her. I don't believe she's the person that she portrayed herself to be in the documentary. Because you have a 14-year-old girl. She's out. She's having sex. She doesn't trust men. She's walking around hitchhiking with an axe. And she didn't come from a bad household or anything like this. And it was at this age of her hitchhiking and doing these things where she said that she was uh, sexually attacked by three adult males. And this scarred her again about men. 1976, just a year later, when she was 15 years old, she decides to run away from home when her mother finds out that she's been sexually active with a lot of different boys. She tells a story what happens one day when she ran away. She was so depressed, she ran to this really high bridge. And when she comes across this bridge, she looks down and she contemplates how she should commit suicide. But looking at the water as it flows down, she says to herself that, hey, I won't die if I jump off this bridge because I am not like Robert Redford in the movie. And that just, it may not seem big to everybody else, just comments like that is sort of, it's sort of to me like Joe Erotica wears his narcissism loud and proud. You can clearly see it. And I feel that Carol has some narcissism just like Joe. She just hides it better than him. She's more intelligent than, than Joe, but she has it. Who tells a story about them committing suicide and just want to stop in the middle of the story and just say, hey, but you know, I'm so awesome. I'm more awesome than that guy in the movie. Now, you know, this little water wouldn't hurt me like it hurt him in the movie. It just, I don't know. It's, it's, it's very small stuff like that when I hear people talk that stick out and, and it just make me go, hmm, hmm. So Carol jumps off the bridge, and when she jumps off the bridge, of course, we know she didn't die. So she was correct that she is better than Robert Redford. But remember what I said. When Carol told the story of how she jumped off this bridge, I'm listening, and I said, I bet you there's not going to be a news report of this. I bet you it's not going to be a news clip. It's not going to be a police file. Nothing. And as soon as I said that in my mind, Carolyn says, that's when a homeless man found me, and he picked me up, and I went home. Bet a hundred dollars no one can find this homeless guy to corroborate this story, this outlandish story that has no witnesses. So shortly after this, she meets her first husband, Mike Murdoch, and they begin dating. They quickly get married in 1978, but she's only 17 years of age. And Carolyn says that, that after being raped by three men at 14 years of age, you know, after the hard stuff she went from hitchhiking, after jumping off of a bridge, she comes across another extraordinary, something that happened in her life to where her first husband sexually attacked her, causing her to get pregnant. While she was pregnant with her daughter in her, her belly at 17 years of age, she said that she tried everything she could to take her daughter's life. She tried to end the pregnancy so bad that she almost passed away starving herself just to starve the baby. But she does have the baby. She's in a marriage that she does not want to be in. And as she's in this marriage that she doesn't want to be in, one day she walks down the road again. She doesn't have her axe this time. And as she's walking down the road, contemplating her life, what she want to do, deathly afraid to leave her husband that she doesn't want to be with, she meets a guy by the name of Magic Don Juan Lewis. Now I'm just I, I'm 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 Magic Don Juan for y'all don't know that's some pimp name stuff. I'm putting the pimp name on him because watch how watch how he does this. Watch how Don Lewis does this. Don Lewis is in his truck. He's 42 years of age, married with children. So Don looks and sees this little 22-year-old woman walking down the street while he's 42 years old. And he's like, mm, let me go ahead and shoot her this fake name right, right quick. So he gives her a fake name. He comes, he tries to talk to her, he tries to get her in the car. But hey, she may look young, but she's been through a lot since she's been 14 years old. So she's not going to get in the car with just anybody. So Don comes back around and swerves again. And this time, he hands her a gun. And he says, if you don't trust me, here, you hold a gun and hold it towards me the entire car ride. I just want somebody to talk to. Pop your collar one time for the Magic Don Juan to get her in the vehicle. Now, now, that part about how he got her, that's in the actual documentary part, right? 
But when I, when, I, when I hear this story, I ask myself, what kind of person would put themselves in this situation? What if he gave her a gun with no bullets in it? Well, he has a gun right here with the bullets in it. What does it say about a person that says, I want to talk to you so badly that here, here's a gun, hold the gun on me. That would freak me out more than a person who just keeps coming by and just stay in his car and keeps talking to me. Now, this could have been a great love story, a great scene had he stayed in the car. Because I, I saw in the movie where a guy stayed in the car and he walked with a woman and they fell in love happily ever after. This is another thing that gets to me about her is he talks to her one night and he gets her in the hotel room and they have sex the first night. How do you go from I'm afraid to get in the car? Not, I'm not even to just having sex, but how do you go to, hey, let's go get a hotel room, wait in the car while I go pay for it? Like what's going on through your... Magic Don Lewis was laying some game. He was laying some major game. The first night, that's not the extraordinary claim that there's no witness to. After this beautiful night they have together, he drives her home the next day. It's daylight. I'm sorry, just these are so these are so outlandish. It's daylight. He lets her off at her house. He's still there in his truck. And another guy rides down the street in his truck, pulls over to the side, jumps out of his truck, and grabs a shotgun and points it at her. This story is about her second husband, Don Lewis, who's going to go missing. So he's not a witness to this story, right? When, even if a guy wants a woman so badly, like he just wants to kidnap a woman on the street, he's going to wait till she's alone. What man wants a woman so badly that he sees she's getting out of a truck with another man to walk from said truck to house and he just pulls over in broad daylight and pulls out a shotgun. But Magic Don Juan Lewis, he wasn't gonna have any of that. He gets out of his truck too, pulls out his gun, I guess that he gave her the night before, and the big old burly guy with the shotgun was afraid of 42 year old Don Lewis with his little gun. This. Didn't come from any news report. This came directly from the mouth of Carol Stairs. The big burly man pointed the gun at me and ordered me into the car. From behind the car, Don told me to run. He was on foot and he had his gun out. He told the man to move on and hollered at me again to run. The man in the car began to drive off and I ran home. She told this story. And again, there's no witnesses. Keep that in mind. Nonetheless, Don messes around with Carolyn for I think the next four years or so before he finally leaves his wife and marries her. The Netflix documentary will have you believe that he married her immediately. They just instantly fell in love and lived happily ever after. No, he stayed with her as a person on the side for the next four years. Which that little piece of information lets me know a lot of more stuff and how he truly feels about her. Now, in the documentary, it's reported that Don Lewis was rich. He had a minimum of about $5 million when he first met Carolyn Stairs, Carol Stairs. But you're going to hear that Carol Stairs has something different. 
what she says that basically she did everything herself. She made all the money. Every business decision that got him millions came from her. He does nothing and Carolyn reports in their marriage that pretty much every business decision she made throughout all of the years until he had dementia and she goes on to say all of these things that he could not do. My, my opinion on the things that he could not do. Outlandish, just like a lot of more stuff in her life with nothing to corroborate it. Where are the medical records or anything that shows or any doctor, or anybody that's going to come up and say that he was diagnosed with dementia? His children don't say it. No one says this information. The only person that says this is Carol Baskin. Now, her third husband by the name of Howard Baskin, whom she gets her name from, he comes across as a very likable person, which I thought was an excellent PR move to the actual documentary because... Carolyn wrote something for her organization page, Big Cat Rescue, but when it came to seeing someone, their emotions, their, their inflections, they use Harold for the YouTube video, and he does come across a lot more better than her, but both of them did uh, something that I noticed. Everyone who watched the documentary wants to know about her, the disappearance of her husband, her husband who just vanished one day. These are the big crucial things that we want to know. Yet, if you look at most of what Henry, what, I'm sorry, if you look at what most of what Howard says in the video, and you look at what Carol wrote, they still attack Joe Erotica. They wanted to show that we didn't have small cages like Netflix said we had. I don't care. I know that they didn't don't they don't have small cages because I've been uh, subscribed to Big Cat Rescue channel for a long time on YouTube. I've watched them all the time. I didn't know all of this crazy stuff was going on, but I don't care about cages. And it was just interesting to me if you look at look at just look at Howard's inflections in the video as he talk about Joe compares them to Joe Erotica. Joe Erotica is in prison. I don't care what bad you say about him. He's not on trial because he's already been on trial. We want to know about the disappearance of his second husband, Don Lewis. That's what we want, we want to know about. And when we get to the, uh, the portion about defending herself against uh, uh, Don Lewis, she says things like, so the meat grinder, she's saying that Netflix betrayed it and showed this huge meat grinder, but they had a little hand meat grinder, so that's not true. We know that Netflix is trying to make stuff sensational. We, we know that we're not sitting here and going like, oh, this is the evidence that's going to put Carol away, a meat grinder. That's, that's you know, far-fetched. The meat grinder being little or small, or did you use it or not, or did the the cat, uh, one of the tigers, eat him? I mean, that makes for newspaper articles, but whether that happened or not, that's not why people are suspicious of your activities. It's the nuances. It's talking about your second husband in the documentary, laughing, smiling all the time. It's little clues that you give away, such as this scene where Joe Erotica was being dragged by a tiger that just was in love with his new pair of shoes. It was something about the smell. And Joe being deranged and crazy as it is, he thought someone poured something on his shoe to, to try to kill him, to make the tiger come at him. So Carol's in her interview and she was like, you have to pour like sardines or something like that. She's um, people's looking at her like, oh, you would know, huh? You would know with your second husband being missing. It's things such as she's saying that she already knew his plane was too small to make it to Costa Rica. He would have never made it. Okay. Well, if you say that his plane is too small, why did you lead on as if him parking by the airplane meant that he was getting on a plane to go to Costa Rica? Everything she was saying was leading up. He goes to Costa Rica every week. Uh, he had other mistresses in Costa Rica. He he had mistresses mistresses throughout the entire marriage. Um, motive, <laughs> like um, the the money issues. It, it seems to me, if you look at what she wrote, she has done nothing wrong in her entire life. Every decision she made, everything she's done is perfect, and it was always someone else's fault. And that's why I'm like, that's why people are, are looking at her like in a, in a shady, shady manner, you know? Um, 
But I go in here and I try to debunk some more of the things. Okie dokie, okie dokie, okie dokie. So I'm going to quickly try to sum and go over. This is Carol Baskin's words. But you guys can read this information for, for yourself on BigCatRescue.org on the main channel if you click on the link. And she gives her reaction to the Netflix documentary. I highly encourage you guys to do this because all of this is simply my opinion. Uh, you want to speak facts? Carol Baskin is innocent of her husband's disappearance because you are innocent in our country until proven guilty. And we should all treat her that way. This is just my opinion. This is just how I feel upon things that I saw. And I always speak out against YouTubers that say their opinion as fact. And then uh, they join into a hate campaign on someone. Uh, so don't join into a hate campaign on Carol Baskin. I believe in my opinion upon the things that I saw that some foul play is involved and she may have something to do with it. That's just what I believe, but I don't encourage anyone to go on. As a matter of fact, when it comes to the sanctuary, I truly do believe in the sanctuary part. I, I do believe that she provides a, a great place for animals to go that have been abandoned, abused, used in circuses and zoos and for profit as, as kittens when they were young and when they get older, discarded. So I just want to put that out there. But with all of that being said, this is her words from the website. So when we look here, look at these topics. One topic says should not be in cages. Um, the other one is cub handling. Let them go free, crowd side, cage size, suing Joe's mother, uh, making money and paying workers. These are all defending her sanctuary versus Joe. Erotic. Sorry, Joe, for calling you erotic in the video. <laughs> but, like, it's so much time devoted to me against going against Joe. Look at this topic. Cats are in cages, so we and Joe are the same. Uh, she says, another idiotic Joe lie. Idiotic Joe lie. If the sanctuary, we take an abandoned, abused, confiscated, and orphan cats and give them a permanent home. And I think that's where she's detached from... Um, public opinion because a lot of us already know this we we know that what she is doing is totally different than what joe erotic and the rest of the people on the documentary were doing we don't care we want to know about your missing husband we don't care about all of this stuff great you 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 won you have a better place that should not even be mentioned in the same category as joe joe the guy that's in prison doing 22 years so you need to learn to let this stuff go, you know. Um, we scroll down. She says there's another topic. Says saving them in a while. Uh, I'm scrolling down, but I'm showing you guys screenshots. <laughs> so on the part at the time leading up to Don's disappearance. This is a very small paragraph about the most serious thing. Uh, in a few years preceding his disappearance, Don's behavior was gradually showing signs of mental deterioration. Originally, Don, from time to time, would buy vehicles or other equipment at auctions with a view to resell them. Although mostly he never got around to reselling them, but gradually his hoarding of junk that he brought to the 40 acres the sanctuary now sits on increased and involved junk of no value. He deteriorated into dumpster diving and even got stuck in the dumpster and called me crying. All oh, she's putting down a missing husband. Because he did not know where he was. <sighs> okay. Because Alzheimer's was not a commonly used word, I had not heard of it. Someone mentioned Alzheimer's to me, and I got done to agree to set up an appointment with a specialist, Dr. Gold, and McQueen, intervened, and convinced him to see her psychiatrist, Dr. Blasini. He referred us to a Dr. West in the same building who was not there, so Dunn saw Dr. Russell. Oh, is she playing Dr. <laughs> Why is she sending her husband, Don Lewis, to play Dr. Musical Chairs? <laughs> he had diagnosed Don with bipolar disorder and gave him a prescription to have an MRI at St. Joseph Hospital. I did not find a prescription hmm, until I was searching his bedside table looking for clues to his disappearance. Now, this is what I'm saying. Okay, she says that he has dementia and all this crazy stuff in her interviews. But when she sends him to Musical Chairs Five Doctors, they come back and say, yeah, he's bipolar. There's so many people on this earth that have bipolar disorder and they aren't missing. They aren't millionaires that you're trying to say because of his clinical bipolar. He ends up crying in a dumpster so he could go run off somewhere by himself. Like 
I don't know. I don't. I don't get it. And if you watch the documentary, no one else agrees with with the things that she's saying. Even in this, his beca- behavior became increasingly strange. He started refusing to use the bathroom and defecating outside. But when you, but even his own lawyer, everybody says that he was of sound mind and body and was sharp as ever leading up to his disappearance. The only person saying these outrageous things are again, Carol who has no witnesses is always something outlandish where she has no witnesses. So then she goes and has an even larger paragraph about Don's wealth. That's larger than the time leading up to his disappearance. What's most important. She says, everyone peached a lot at Don was a millionaire when I met him. Yeah, he had business cutting the axles off of trailers, pulling by tractors and selling the boxes of storage. Now, I want to read all of this verbatim. I just want to hit the key points of what I was saying when you saw me on the screen last. She talks of him having a 20000 loan in default that she overheard. He he took his 22-year-old mistress about his dealings with serious stuff like this. Okay. Uh, he got the information. He could not read first. He could not read beyond a first grade level. Again, these are all claims that only she says. Ask me to look into it. She does everything. She's superwoman. Uh, we bought a loan for a close and sold the property property for a substantial profit. That is what got us into the real estate business. We started buying default loans from banks and going uh, to tax deed sales. This was before this became a popular business. With me doing the research, negotiations, and title clearing on the properties, we built this to a portfolio of properties to rent and resell that was worth around five millions. So she's saying that she met him. He only had a hundred thousands of dollars, six digits. But with her doing the research, the negotiations, the title clearing on the property, she got him to the million. So she's the one that did all of this stuff, even though everyone has always reported him as being a millionaire even before they met her. Will anyone corroborate the things that she's saying? I will, I'm going to bet my money that they won't. Uh, we kept the properties in the trust. Ten years before the verse. Uh, you guys will read that when you go to the website. I'm more reading this talking about her personality, how she does everything right. The man people, the main people interview and their lies. So now she's going to trash his children and the rest of his family just to say that they are... Um, not telling the truth but there's one part on here that i want to go over with you guys the restraining order listen to what she says about the restraining order she says don spent one week per month in costa rica don was a man who wanted to have sex daily he would go to costa rica during the week i was having my menstrual cycle i accepted this as something i had to live with during the week he was away, I would haul off the property as much of the junk as I could. Wendell told Dunn I was doing this. Dunn tried calling the police to get them to stop me. They told him uh, he would need a restraining order. It is unclear if it was Dunn's idea to get that to get a restraining order. He should say I threatened him or if someone like Wendell suggested that. <laughs> but you have no witness, right? Dunn filed the order on June 20th, 1997, and it was denied. Dunn disappeared two months later on August the 18th, 1997. And claims Dunn told her to give the document to the police. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, you guys looked that up. I, think, I don't know if that if Ann's his daughter or his, uh, his ex-wife. I think it's his daughter. But Ann told Dunn to give her the document to the police if anything happened to him. If someone tells you that and a person disappears two months later, do you forget that as Ann claims? No, you remember and give it to the police immediately. But Dan, but uh, Ann did not tell the police uh, or me about it until September the 9th of 1997. Now, I look at these dates here and I don't see anything wrong with this. When you are befuddled and you're going through a lot of trauma, you, you do forget the simplest things. It would be a red flag to me if Don went missing on August the 18th. And then all of a sudden, nine months later, she goes and says, oh, here's a restraining order. This it, he was he was he went missing on August the 18th. She went to the police on September the 9th with the restraining order and the restraining order is real. It, it is something she can't get behind. She can say whatever reason she feels that he made the restraining order, but he made a restraining order and he disappeared two months later. You don't find that 
peculiar? <laughs> I mean, every rational human being is going to find that peculiar, you know? And then she goes into and being an embezzler, a liar, all of this other stuff that she would not have any proof of. So, uh, and again, you see the paragraph where it says fly to Costa Rica. It, it, she says the entire discussion of whether done small planes could fly to Costa Rica was totally irrelevant. The planes could not fly that far and no one ever suggested they could. Don had purchased a number of properties in Costa Rica and after his disappearance, one of the character takers called and told me there were people reported reporting seeing him there i guarantee you that <laughs> there's no record of a caretaker saying this uh, when she had records and you guys can go when you see on the website she put links to what evidence she has on here that you can go and look up she only put two links or uh, well, three links on this whole thing and these links were about uh cases with Anne. Okay, Anne is uh, Don's trusted assistant. Okay, so it's not his daughter or his wife. It's his trusted assistant, as she says. So there's some kind of money claim against Anne, but it's nothing to do uh, dealing with his disappearance. She has, she doesn't have any links or anything dealing with any evidence, and you guys will see that again when you go to the site. Just some things I just wanted to go over and, and put in here to more clarify of why I was saying the things that I was saying. That's all. The last thing I want to say to you guys, though, is then when she said that about the sardine on Joe Erotica's shoes and, and how that could be a way you can get a cat to, you know, eat someone, everybody ran to Twitter and stuff, and they was posting that as memes and stuff. But I want to read to you all something she said in her own words, right? Um, which I thought was interesting. Her and her husband, Don Lewis, who's missing, you know, she told the story of how they purchased their first cat and how she was relentless and she was going to do everything she could to outbid and get this cat. And after, and of course, in the story, it wasn't Don who got the cats who started their their business of Big Cat Rescue. It wasn't him at all. Of course, it was her. She, she's perfect. She's the most smartest woman in the world. She does everything right. Of course, it was her. It was not Don. But no witnesses. Outlandish. But okay, we're going to go back. But it's just interesting to me that after she got the sale, this, this is what she said. I just don't see the problem. I see it sort of split screen in my head. On the left is what I have. On the right is what I want. That clarity makes it possible for me to make quick decisions about what needs to be done right now. Thinking about the UFC fighter John Jones for so many years, he came across trying to be this perfect, all well put together Christian guy. And the more he tried to do his fake persona, the more trouble he got himself into. Crazy people are acting when they try to be a normal person. So they do what they think a normal person would do. So in my opinion, the mannerisms, the poise, everything that you see is her trying to pretend to be a normal person. But inside, if you look at it, she fought. She fought tooth and nail with Joe Erotica, back and forth. She was just as much as involved as he was, you know? She didn't even have to have contact with him she, or, or, or uh, to do the smear campaign. She could have just kept it legal and went to the government to get the bill passed that would stop people that have for-profit uh, locations to where you can see and pet exotic animals, you know. But she chose to go into that back and forth. And when I look at that situation, you know, and I look at everything that she, out of her own mouth, said that she went through in her life, and how she viewed men. And I take this story of how she said her and Don Lewis got their first, hat, their first cat. I say to myself, a woman who has not trusted men since she was 14 years old, who was raped by three men, um, that she said, um, that was abused by her husband, a woman who had the fear in her of how do I leave my relationship with my first husband, when I got this daughter, now I'm in this same situation, this guy who made me wait all of these years before he would even leave his wife and allegedly cheated on me the entire time. 
what does a woman do if she thinks, I just don't see the problem. I see it sort of split screen in my head. On the left is what I have. On the right is what I want. That clarity makes it possible for me to make quick decisions about what needs to be done right now. If you have any information that you would like to give, the investigation due to the Netflix documentary is back open and running again for the disappearance of Don Lewis. The link will be in the description and I will see you guys really shortly this same week on Gannon Stalk. Thank you guys for watching and again, don't kill, make a sandwich. <laughs>